Those of you who've been here long enough, tell them welcome to the family, right? Because in this room, we are and when because we are family when you are strong and when you are weak that's what families do right okay you noticed last week we took a week off from our normal study of uh thessalonians we ended two weeks ago the study on first thessalonians and this week we're going to begin our study of Second Thessalonians. Second, first and Second Thessalonians, as you know, is a letter that was written shortly after the establishment in the church in Thessalonica. And there were, when we look at First Thessalonians, which we already studied, Paul looked at his personal reflections in chapters one, two, and three, and then he provided them apostolic instructions in chapters four, five, and six. The theme of First Thessalonians seems to be holiness in view of the future coming of Christ. Each of the five chapters of the book of First Thessalonians mentions the second coming of Christ. It's an important thing. By the way, church, I want to make sure everybody's got this. I don't spend a lot of time talking about the end of the world, right? Why not? Because the end of your world is coming. If we go back to the apostles and the first century Christians, they were convinced, a lot of people believe, that Jesus Christ would return during their lifetime. Were they right? No. As we move through the 2000 years since the time of Christ, there have been many people who predicted that it's the end of the world, time is coming. And guess what? So far, they've all been wrong. However, in 1841, the Adventist movement began with a prophecy of the end of the world going to be 1841. Then they moved it to 1842, and both prophecies were wrong. However, for all of the people who were believers in 1839, guess what? Their world has come to an end. And for each of us, 100 years from now, if Jesus Christ hasn't returned, our world will be ended. The time for us to repent and build a relationship with Christ will be finished. It's done. We have to do this while we were alive. Not long after the period of time between first and second Thessalonians, is thought to be less than a year apart. Second Thessalonians contains a whopping three verses. So if your preacher says, go to first, Th go second Thessalonians chapter four, you know, I'm, tr I'm tricking on you. Okay. I do that sometimes go to Jude chapter two. <laughs> okay. The coming of Christ is an important theme in second Thessalonians and it continues. Paul is going to tell the Christians to maintain their faith in spite of persecutions. And he cautions them or warns them against false concepts related to the return of Christ. I checked. As of this morning, we are continuing to wait for the return of Jesus Christ. And there may be <coughs> times 
that you and I are persecuted for being Christians. By the way, try in the corporate world today to tell somebody they're not living for Christ and see how that goes. Let's see if you get persecuted. Will it happen? Yes, it will. This letter, therefore, is very relevant. It relates to the time in which you and I live. So as we begin this series of lessons based on 2 Thessalonians, this lesson is going to be an introduction to the letter of 2 Thessalonians. Who is the author? The Apostle Paul is the author. And it's confirmed by a signature that he attaches to this letter. By the way, in case you didn't get this yet, have your Bibles open to 2 Thessalonians. Put a bookmark there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. When the pages quit, everybody's there. If you're fast and the person next to you is kind of slow, help them out a little bit. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse 17. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Don't have time for an exposition of that right now, but you'll notice that Paul signs all of his letters. So he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, right? Those who do not attribute Paul to being the writer of the book of Hebrews, and there are a number who don't, point out the fact that Paul did not sign the letter. And he didn't. Back on our topic. Early church sources or historical Christians that attribute the letter of 2 Thessalonians to Paul include Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and Irenaeus. Three guys, if you read their books, they're cool, but you're going to have to take time. Early Christian, they're known as early Christian fathers. Uh, Clement of Alexander studied under John the Apostle, or so extra biblical history tells us. We will notice that Paul is joined by Silvanius and Timothy, who together with Paul established this church in Thessalonica. Leave your bookmark in 2 Thessalonians. We're coming back. Go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And verse 1. Looks like everybody's there. In Thessalonica, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphilius and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. We will notice as we study the Apostle Paul that he went to the Jewish people on the Saturday or Sabbath because that was the day they gathered together. If you want to preach and you want to affect people, what do you do? Go preach to an empty closet? No, you go preach to the crowds, right? And we'll notice that's what Paul continues to do throughout his ministry. Verse 2, as was his custom, Paul went to the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. By the way, not a lot has changed in 2,000 years. The backbone of this church, the backbone of every church I've ever been in has always been 
the women. It's true. Now, they joined Paul, who's at Sylvanius and Timothy, joined Paul in his salutation in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, and Timothy was also known as Timotheus. What do we know about Timothy? We know that Timothy was considered by Paul to be his son in the faith. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. First Timothy chapter one, verse two. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now we will also notice as we read the text from First Thessalonians that Paul was joined there by Timothy. He signed the letter. Timothy also served as an emissary or messenger for Paul when he sent Timothy back to find out how they were doing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and also verse 6. Paul, Silvanius, and Timothy were naturally concerned about the welfare of the church that was in Thessalonica. By the way, if I were to leave here one day, do you think I would be worried about the church that's in Ceylon Kaviti? Sempre, of course. Do I have spiritual children here? I think yes. Would I be worried about them? Yes, I would. So it's natural for Paul to have this concern related to his children in the faith. So what do we, that's who wrote the letter. What do we know about the recipients of the letter, the people who got the letter? Well, Thessalonica was the capital city and the largest city in a Roman province that was known as Macedonia. It's located along the Ignatian Way, which means nothing. If anybody here knows anything about the Ignatian Way, raise your hand. No. It was a major trade thoroughfare that led from Rome to the Eastern provinces. Now, what do we know even today about cities that are on trade thoroughfares? We know that there's a lot of people that go there. We know that Thessalonica served for that province as a city, as a center of or focus of the trade and commerce. Today, they've changed the spelling a little bit, but it's all still known as Thessalonica. So what do we know about the church? Its establishment, as I pointed out, happened in Acts chapter 17. And it occurred on Paul's second missionary journey. As Paul and his companions had just left Philippi, they traveled through Amp Amphilius and Apollonia, and they arrived at Thessalonica, so the scripture already told us. They went to the synagogue on three consecutive Saturdays. Why did they go to the synagogue? They went to the synagogue because that was their opportunity for evangelism. For three weeks, he reasoned with the Jews. And by the way, he converted some of the Jews. But not only did he convert Jews, he converted God-fearing Greeks or Gentiles. Unbelieving Jews, however, soon caused a disturbance. A big riot is what they caused. And it forced Paul to leave Thessalonica. Despite such clouded or ominous beginnings, a strong church was founded in Thessalonica. And what do we know from 1 Thessalonians? It quickly gained a good reputation, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8. The church was mostly made up of Gentiles or Greeks, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9. Members included Jason 
Acts 17 and 9, Aristarchus and Segundus, Acts chapter 20 and verse 4. From the first letter, we learned that persecution of the church had continued even after Paul left, and this gave him grave concern or a lot to worry about. Yet they remained strong, and this gave Paul great comfort, and we know that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Paul was encouraged by what Timothy had reported. Paul wrote that in his first letter, first epistle. However, it was not long after that that Paul found it necessary to write another letter. So then we might ask, where and when did Paul write this letter? As we went through 1 Thessalonians, Corinth was suggested as a place from which the letter was written, simply based on that's the next place he went to. And Paul had only been gone a short time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. He had sent Timothy back from Athens, who had returned, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Yet Paul did not stay very long in the city of Athens, Acts chapter 17, verse 16 through chapter 18, verse 1. And Timothy came back from Macedonia after Paul had arrived in Corinth, Acts chapter 18 and verse 5. Therefore, the first letter was likely written soon after Paul got to Corinth, and Paul stayed in Corinth for about 18 months, Acts chapter 18, verse 11. If Paul wrote the first letter at the beginning of his stay, I'm going to be here 18 months. I write a letter right when I get here. I write a second letter not too long afterwards, less than a year later. Where am I? Same place in Corinth, right? So that's where we got. He could have easily written the second letter towards the end of his first year. Therefore, the second letter was most likely also written from the city of Corinth. So what do we have for a date? When was the letter written? Paul arrived in Corinth sometime around 50 or 52 AD. However, the second letter occurred about a year later, a little less. So if it was 52 when he got there and the letter was written less than a year later, somebody tell me when this letter was probably written. 52 plus one makes 53, right? sometime between 51 and 53. So why did he write the letter? What was the purpose of this letter of 2 Thessalonians? And as we read and study this letter ourselves, we're going to find that the church at Thessalonica remained strong in the Lord despite persecution. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is, say it, church, increasing. increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you are enduring. By the way, having been a minister, let me tell you some things, okay? You bring somebody to the faith, they learn, guess what happens? You're proud of the progress that they make. Sometimes I know I might embarrass you if I ask you to quote a verse or list, give me the books in the New Testament or give me a plan of salvation. Maybe that causes a little embarrassment and I'm guilty. But do you know why I do it? Because I'm proud of you. So Paul bragged on his church at Thessalonica. I guess it's okay if I brag a little bit about the church in Salon, right? However, it's apparent from this letter 
that somebody had come in and started teaching them false doctrines or they had developed a misunderstanding about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some of the members were beginning to be troubled by reports that maybe those who fell asleep weren't going to see the return of Christ. We covered that in our lesson about three weeks ago, right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, say it together, church, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, rather by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. It's future tense. It has not yet occurred, right? It still hasn't occurred. Other people in the church said, Jesus is going to be back next week. There's no need in me working. So they stopped working. Maybe their assumption was that since it's coming, I don't need to be working. I don't need to be doing the things that God put me on earth to do. And I don't need to work anymore. Paul is going to address this. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11 and starting, tells us, we hear that, by the way, church, let's read 11 and 12 together. I want the church to know this. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. I don't want to work. That's not what Paul says is okay. The return of Christ, I can tell it's going to be next week or next month. No need to work, right? That's not what Paul says, is it? Now, Paul appears to have a threefold purpose in writing this letter. Number one was to encourage them to remain steadfast, stay with the faith in spite of their persecution. Number two was to correct their misunderstanding about the imminence, meaning immediacy, meaning closeness, proximity of the Lord's return. And the third one was to instruct the congregation on what disciplinary action to take towards those who refuse to work. Now, Let's take a look at the encouragement he gives them in their persecutions. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1 and following. We're all there. It shouldn't take long. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from the God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have, one for another, is increasing. Verse 4, therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble for those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God 
and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Verse 10, on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at all those who have believed, this includes you. Because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll notice in verses one through four that Paul addressed them with his salutation. Salutation, when we write a letter today, it'll go, dear brethren, or dear whoever's name, right? That's what he did. We're going to encourage them, or he encouraged them in their trials and in the view of the coming of Christ to remain strong, verses five through 10. And then 11 and 12 was what? A prayer for them. He's going to, we don't have time for all of it today, give, enlighten them about the return of Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through 17. He's going to tell them that apostasy or falling away must occur first, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. He's going to encourage them to stay steadfast, to stay with the face. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. He's going to exhort them to continue to live for Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. He's going to request a prayer from them 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. He's going to charge them to discipline the disorderly, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. And then he's going to close with some remarks. The emphasis of this book is going to be steadfast, strong, steady, confident, secure, be the people that God wants you to be. It's been suggested that a title for this might, book might be Steadfastness While Waiting for the Return of Jesus Christ. In keeping with that theme, I'm going to offer the following passage as the key verse to this entire letter. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts, mine, yes, yours, yes, all of us, yes. Encourage your heart and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Now, as we work our way through this letter, it's going to be my prayer that our study will lead to our group being steadfast. Steadfast in our service to God as we wait for what? The return of Jesus Christ. But we know that he may or may not return during our lifetime, right? 
not worried about the end of the world because we don't know when that's coming, but we know the end of our world will be sooner, right? Jesus could come this afternoon, I'd be wrong. But with all probability, the end of our world will come before the end of the world. And we need to be focused on having that right relationship so that we can truly be recipients of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we know, it's a free gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We don't earn it. I didn't earn it. You can't earn it. It's a free gift of God to be received by grace. However, we have to play our part. The first part is we have to hear the word of God. We have to hear what Jesus says. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 tells us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word about Jesus Christ. We have to repent. Repent, yes. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 tells us, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We have to confess in Jesus Christ. Now, I've been told that you guys have heard me speak this before, so I'm going to speak it. Don't run off to any extremes, right? You've heard me say almost every Sunday that I do not have the power to forgive God, but it's not a requirement that I forgive you, that God forgives you, right? Well, at the same time, we want to take a look at James chapter 5 and verse 16. Go there. James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So can any of us in this room forgive sins? No. But is it scriptural for us to confess our sins to each other? Yes. That being said, we're going to go back to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that tells us we must confess. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Verse 10, for it is with the heart that one believes and, it is, and is justified, and it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. We have to be baptized. First Peter chapter three, verse 21 tells us, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as the removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Great. Once baptized, always saved, right? No, that's good. No, not true. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 tells us, therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape. For who? For all of us. That being said, if you're a member of this church or not a member of this church, and you are in need of prayers for medical healing, for well-being, for jobs, for the problems that come in this life, come down here, have a seat, let us know, and we'll be glad to take care of that for you. If you're a member of this church, or not a member of this church, and you have fallen back in love with the ways of the world, can it happen? Yes, it can. And you are in need of being restored, come have a seat and we'll say a prayer for you so that we can have you restored to Christ. 
if it's a private sin, leave it between you and God. We don't forgive sin. We can present a prayer for you. That being said, there's one more group. If you have never been baptized for the remission of your sins through the saving power of Jesus Christ, do me a favor. Come up here while together we stand and sing the invitation song. Let's all stand. Sing him number 255. I am resolved. 255. Let's sing. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the word delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, this have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten to glad and free. Jesus, great as I am, I will come to thee too. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin as He is the true one, he is the just one, he had the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten to glad and free. Jesus, great as highest, I will come to Living the path 